Hello everybody, it's Whiskey11, and welcome back to the Gaming Lounge, and in this episode, which should be episode number 5 of our Let's Play of Silent Hunter 4, we are going to take our brand new boat out on patrol, and we are going to have a brilliant time with it. But what you will see is that uh, we have already actually left port. And, well, that's because there is an episode in between here in which I do nothing but pick up uh, sailors from, I believe this is the Battle of Coral Sea. And, or the remnants of the Battle of Coral Sea. We got to play lifeguard duty. It was an entire hour-long episode of doing nothing but picking up downed airmen. We picked up, um, uh, I want to say it was 16 uh, downed airmen. And I, I just, it really wasn't entertaining. So I decided to go ahead and do it the, this way. So uh, I, <laughs> we got so many of them. It just, it just, it just wasn't worth it. But of course, here we are in the USS Skipjack and we are sailing along quite nicely here. Uh, we are going to attempt to pick up one downed air airman. And uh, it'll kind of give you an idea how the mechanic works. Uh, can't really see it right now. There's a couple of... Uh, you'll see them that are like bright orange or pink. Yeah, there's one. Uh, you'll see a couple of like bright orange or pink um, sailors. Uh, like smoke clouds off in the distance where the... Uh, smoke grenades, I guess you could call it, from their uh, flotation pack is at. Um, we're close enough to this guy that we'll go ahead and we'll go try and catch him. But uh, again, I'm recording this video in post, so... <laughs> uh, I love losing data. It's so great. But on the upside to this, I do get to show this how this works. Unfortunately, we weren't able to actually pick him up because this game is horribly bugged at times. Once we leave... Uh, this area, we're going to head up to a Rabal. I will try and keep that corrected from here on out. Uh, there might be some issues. I have six more episodes already pre-recorded that uh, I have the audio for, so... Patience. That's all I got to say. Patience. Where'd you go? There he is. So when you do the time compression, uh, there's some really interesting things that happen with time compression. When you're on the surface like I am now and you're looking out on you're actually on the bridge of the ship and you're looking uh, out ahead of you if you time compress or time accelerate too much what ends up happening is, is they end up going at like Mach 70 away from you like you you physically cannot catch them no matter what fleet boat you're in and uh, it gets really annoying because they will run and 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 run, run forever However, if you go to the map and do the time compression, you can go as fast as you want and they don't move. So you can see here, he's moving ever so slightly left to right, but if you go too fast, what ends up happening is, is he'll just like warp. <laughs> it's really annoying. So you're kind of limited to 4X while you do this. Otherwise, what ends up happening is, is like I said, he just, he, he goes too fast, you can't catch up to him. And uh, the mechanic, the reason why this is so buggy is your everything is done through the binoculars well the binoculars are not image stabilized so in fact no, nothing is image stabilized in these so as you get closer and closer you have to hold the crosshairs of the binoculars over the downed pilot and press a button in the uh control bar down in the bottom left hand corner all of this has to happen where, and it's like the margin of error around the down pilot is extremely small here, you'll see. Okay, so gotta, gotta get the vertical line on him. Whoop. Yep, you yes, need to go. You'd think you'd need to go a little bit closer, but the truth of the matter is you don't. So uh, the, fir the first 16 that we picked up, by the way, were in extremely rough seas, which was added challenge because now th there, there's an example of them warping. It's an added challenge because now they're bouncing up and down, up and down, and you can't see where the heck they're at, and because you can't see them, you can't actually, uh, you know, you can't actually do the recover down to Eric Raymond. So there he is. You can see him bobbing in the water there. 
And this is just, this is actually relatively stable compared to the garbage I was dealing with in the rough seas. But uh, well, there's another one off in the distance. Yes, sir. Back emergency. Try and slow down. And the icon is in the it's in the bottom bar there. It looks like a like a donut, like a life preserver. And uh, you can see not working. Not able to get it to come up, which is super freaking annoying and super old. Um, just trying to kind of figure out whether or not it's worth actually hanging around for this dude or not. <sighs> Sorry, buddy. We, we we picked up 16 of your comrades. I'm going to try and pick you up before we can go, but... So, here I am trying to spam the, the rescue survivor button, and it's just not working. Uh, it really, yes, really, sir. really, Hello. really, really, yes, really annoying how buggy this is. There is, like, this magical range where if they're in the right place, you can actually do it. But, uh... Nowhere near that for this, unfortunately. And even if you put him in, like you can see, it's not image stabilized. We're, we're still moving up and down quite a bit. And at no point in this is it actually recovering it. The other part that makes it really annoying is, is you don't have to hit the button once. You have to continuously hit it and it has to happen a couple of times for it to actually register in game. Yes, so I don't know if it's a bug in game or how you want to word it, but it, it's a flawed gameplay mechanic, I guess is the best way to word it. Um, so there you can see I tried doing some added time acceleration to get him to move further away from us, thinking, well, maybe that's that. Just trying and trying and trying and trying to, to figure out how we can get him aboard. Because you do get uh, about 500 renown for each one of these guys that you bring back. That adds up quick, especially you want to get all that renown early in the game because add-ons and upgrades to your ship become ridiculously expensive as uh, as you go on and you have to use that renown in order to uh, uh, purchase upgrades and more modern torpedoes you know like right now the mark 14 is free to us but later on we're going to get access to like the mark 27 cutie homing torpedo which is a fantastic defensive torpedo uh, we'll get access to uh, electric torpedoes i can't remember mark 18 i think i think that's what it is off the top of my head and the mark Mark 18 electric torpedo is also exceptionally useful. They're expensive, though. I mean, really expensive. I think they're about 500 renown a pop uh, for the Mark 18, and then the Cutie, the Mark 27 Cutie homing torpedo, is uh, also really expensive. I want to say it's about a thousand a pop. So you end up not using those very often. You end up carrying them, just messing around with them. But you know. Uh, yeah, getting that renown now is very important, but uh, I'm, I'm also not interested in spending 25 minutes trying to get this guy like I did in the last episode. So we're just going to return to course, set ourselves yes, back sir. up to head standard. We're going to go up to Rabal and see, yes, what, uh, see what kind of shipping we got in port, or at least in the area. I mean, as, as we sail away from this guy, I'm going to try and continue, you know, I'm going to continue to try and get him, but we're, we're returning to course. We're set to a head standard. I mean, he's moving, so he's not dead. That's a good sign. It's the one thing that I wish this game, like, all the mods and stuff that are in this game, you would have think they would have done a little bit extra work to try and resolve issues like this, but... You know, even with them in the middle of the scope, even with them at the bottom of the scope, there's it just doesn't it doesn't work. Sometimes the depth marker is off. Sometimes the hitbox for it is off. It's just it's really really frustrating. It took a long time to get the 16 that we got. Um, it's just it's it's just really frustrating. There's a couple of other mechanics like that in this game, like when you drop off um, when you drop off supplies or commandos near the shore uh, sometimes what will happen is uh, you'll you'll drop them off and it'll like it'll make the collision sound like when another ship hits you it's really loud that's another really annoying bug and it's just like this little lifeboat sometimes that lifeboat will sink I mean, uh, it gets old uh, what's interesting about this, though, is all of those aircrew remain in the water for months. 
I uh, I don't know what what's going on there with playing lifeguard duty, but uh, they're there for a long time. Even like after we we finish this patrol and head back, and then come back to the area, like it's forever. It's legit forever. Uh, I want to say they were there almost until the naval battle of Guadalcanal. It was it was pretty intense. So we're gonna set our course here to skirt the destroyer zone and we're going to check and see how many if any destroyers there are at Rabal. Now Rabal at this point in the war should have a fairly substantial Japanese naval presence uh, defending it. Uh, in the default game there's actually a whole crap ton of submarine nets, mines, um, there's even uh, well I mean there's a lot of destroyers just in general in the area but uh, <laughs> There's a lot of destroyers, plus there's uh, warships that sit in the actual harbor, like aircraft carriers, and uh, maybe we might get lucky. Real fleet boat might... Real fleet boat. I want to keep adding an L to boat for some odd reason. Real fleet bloat. Now, real fleet, fleet boat it does send you on uh, photographing missions, recon missions, in which you are um, asked or tasked with finding... Um, you know, certain Japanese ships and, and actually, like, taking pictures of them through the periscope. It's really neat. It's really stressful, especially de depending on what harbors they send you into, depending on what torpedoes you have access to. If you have access to some of the electric torpedoes, it's not as big of a deal because they're wakeless. Uh, the real good one is the hydrogen peroxide torpedoes later on in the game. Those ones are always really fun to get. So here we've sent out our scout plane. <laughs> Uh, oh, hey, there's a tanker. That's an important kill. So this will, this would actually be worth it. Um, haven't seen any destroyer escorts yet, so I mean that's that's an interesting uh, tweak and change of events. Uh, maybe they're maybe they're not here yet. I do know that uh, in later videos that I've already recorded, there are definitely destroyers guarding Rabal, and uh, no no valuable shipping is actually in Rabal at that time so we can actually uh because we have the mark 14 because we do have fairly long range torpedoes we can actually uh slot ourselves right where we need to be so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go to periscope Single depth it's gonna do three, four, uh, apparently we're not going to periscope depth quite yet <laughs> yes, sir. Periscope depth. there we go yes, sir. <laughs> a little early to that draw apparently but uh so yeah, I mean, uh, th these these missions, generally speaking, uh, aren't intended to be very rewarding. Real fleet boat uh, deprioritized the amount of ships in certain harbors compared to the stock game. Also, there's a bug with this. Here's another bug. Look at what the crew isn't doing. We got some crew donning some scuba gear. <laughs> uh, yeah, bugs. So part of that has to do with the fact that uh, your deck crews and all that... Uh, oh, you got promoted. Nice. Part of that has to do with the fact that your deck crew, like all of your deck crew slots, are actually occupied. But uh, we'll keep we'll keep checking on in here. Again, it doesn't really matter. Nothing's up on... Uh, nothing's up on our sonar. So when you're underwater, you actually get really good detection of enemy ships uh, if they're moving. So if we don't get any any sonar contacts, that means there's no destroyer escorts in here. And and we would have already seen the destroyer escorts out further. The destroyer escorts um, or anti-submarine patrols around Rabal usually hover around the entrance area. And we're, we're well into the actual harbor at this point. Um, but the ship that we want is all the way on the right-hand side. That guy is a tanker. He's about 10,000 tons worth. He's a big one. He's the one we want. And the best part is he is stationary. He's not a large European tanker. He's a large modern tanker. 10,000 tons. So we definitely want him. Uh, because we are firing up against the stationary target, it's not a huge deal. What we'll do is we'll set up uh, we'll set up a deep running shot for this. I want to show you guys kind of what, uh, what those kinds of shots would look like. <laughs> No, that's not the problem. The problem is, is the spotting. Also a bug in this game. 
Uh, so while we can physically see the ship, the captain is not willing to keep the uh, keep the information locked in, apparently. So we'll set our position keeper there so that uh, we've got him locked up. It doesn't matter how far the actual marker itself is. We just got to be careful not to hit the edge of the uh, of the pier there. So we'll set up a deep shot. Uh, that deep shot with the magnetic pistol. Um, again, part 14, you know, supposed to be the new fangle dangle thing. What we ended up realizing is that we just don't have the correct, um, just don't, it just didn't work. So we've got contact influence. We need one that's set up for contact. And we'll just go ahead and uh, lock them up check again now the the actual drawing itself is not super accurate in, in the the map mode but uh it's close enough that uh the shots that we're gonna take or one of them is gonna just barely miss the uh just barely miss the um just barely miss the pier there so again we have one that's set to detonate below that's got the contact influencer Ooh, it's gonna be close very close we got the one that's set with the contact influence detonator and then we've got uh, one that's set for contact only and at this angle we should get we should get detonations on at least for sure the contact one because we're gonna hit kind of on that bow area and with the bow uh, not a huge risk of um, not a huge risk of getting duds off of the bow. That's the one thing that the Mark IV team was really good at, which contrasted German magnetic influence uh, pistols. So the U.S. Mark XIV contact detonator and the Mark XIV would only detonate if you were off 90 degrees. The Germans had the exact opposite problem in which it would only detonate if you hit at near perfect 90 degree angles. Uh, by the way, they also struggled with magnetic influence detonators on their torpedoes. And it wasn't until 1943 that they got one that even came close to resembling reliable. The United States gave up almost entirely on the project until after the war. Uh, they kind of dilly-dallied with it for several years. I think it was officially removed in 19, like late 42, early 43. So about the time that the Germans managed to figure out a way to make it somewhat reliable. The other thing that they did that was different from the Americans is they actually tuned their magnetic influence detonators per the locale that they were at. The United States, um, we didn't. <laughs> uh, we, we just we just switched back to contact influence detonators as opposed or contact detonators instead of the contact influence detonators. So, the other thing, too, that was uh, never really fixed fully uh, that both nations struggled with was depth keepers. Um, the Mark 14 had several problems with depth keeping, which is why anytime you do these magnetic influence shots, it's highly recommended that you... Uh... Okay, we got one went off, and... Uh, that, one, that one actually didn't go off until it hit the, hit the, the ground. So that one actually detonated underneath the ship by virtue of the ground. It's still a good hit. I think that it did a significant amount of damage. Uh, but we're just not going to get the broken hole uh, symbology. The, um, the oh, there's a ship beached. <laughs> nice. We're just not going to get the damage to the hole like we would have had it uh, contacted it. But uh, yeah, the Mark 14's depth keeping was absolutely terrible. So if you're playing this game or playing any game that realistically uh, operates with the Mark 14, uh, to get those keel shots, the best thing that you can do with that is set the depth on the torpedo to be exactly uh, the depth of the ship that you're shooting at. Uh, with how deep the Mark 14 tends to run, um, you can actually get more reliable. It, it'll either hit right at the keel because it kept, you know, it's accurate. Uh, <laughs> it's accurate. Oh, looks like we're setting up for another one. 
Uh, it'll either detonate because it actually, uh, you know, hits the actual key line, or um, what'll end up happening is it will... Oh, yeah, that really doesn't matter. <laughs> sure. Uh, it'll either de it'll either detonate because it actually contacts at an angle, um, which will set the Mark 14 torpedo off, or it'll pass under. And if you're really, really lucky and praying to the RNG gods, you might just maybe get a lucky uh, under keel detonation. All right, so I think we're all set up here. We Again, we want to be ooh, high speed. I don't know that I want to do high speed. High speed's okay with the... Uh, uh, it'd be nice to not have the range so that we have to do the low speed. So what's interesting about the Mark 14 is the United States never actually used uh, the low speed setting on the Mark 14 very often. It was almost entirely all set up to run the the high speed. So that dude is definitely going to sink, provided he doesn't bottom out, and he has. So this is one thing that's really frustrating about uh, this game is some... It's another... I, I'm going to call it a bug. Uh, when it comes to attacking ships in harbors like this... One of the issues you run into is the ships, when they contact the ground anywhere, they will actually, like, prop up on that one corner rather than sink. Um, super annoying. <laughs> super duper extra quadruple duple annoying. Almost as annoying as the Mark 14's magnetic influence detonator not working. <laughs> Almost. Okay. So, let's see what we get for torpedo hits on this dude. So, we got one that, that it looks like he's running at a fairly decent depth. Like, I would think that he'd be good to go. Also, the other key to this, too, that um, I didn't do in this, and that's you probably want to launch the deep runner first. That way, if the uh, if it doesn't go, or if it does go off, like in this case, if the first one goes off and it raises the ship out of the water, yeah raise the ship out of the water any you might not get that detonation like that so that is what commonly happens with the mark 14 and it wasn't like that was that was almost the perfect depth for uh for that con that influence detonator that magnetic pistol to have detonated and uh, as you can see we kind of got robbed so we'll wait and we'll wait patiently for our turp since we, we all we're limited here by right now is time on station. Uh, the only thing that's really causing us problems is the, uh, is, you know, aircraft here where you don't have to worry about um, enemy destroyers. Oh, yeah. It probably helps to open the tube. High speed and contact. We don't have to worry about destroyers, so we can, we can remain on station so long as... Darkness allows us to remain under undetected. I mean, we're underwater. Yeah. See, now he's trapped on the the front of the. That's 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 annoying. So we can remain detected so long as it's nighttime, effectively, even being underwater. During the daytime, if you're above water, any any enemy aircraft that uh, comes into the area can um, uh, see spot you, and that's not any good. Are we going to miss? Oh my, I think we're going to miss. I think we're just going to miss. That's expensive. <laughs> you know, the Mark 14 was one of the most expensive torpedoes at the sea. Now look. Foop. <laughs> we're going to get torpedo impact only because it impacted the, uh, the seawall. So we're going to set this to go just a smidge more right. And wait. And wait. And wait. And wait. And wait. Oh, we're, we're like definitely traveling in the water there. Traveling well deep into it. Oh. Ooh. She's like, do we get a kill credit for it? Nope. Skipjack doesn't have any kill credits for, uh, for him. But uh, maybe it takes us putting a torpedo in his face. Oh, all of our torpedoes are fully loaded. Apparently the crew was super excited. 
Uh. <laughs> yeah, we definitely want a contact. <clears throat> All right. So another torpedo out. Torpedo in the water. Yes, thank you. I'm glad that it's not a circle runner cuz uh that also can happen. And hopefully we can catch this. Oop, nice. Nice. And where does this guy hit at? Do we get lucky, punk? Oh, yeah. Hit far forward. She's going down. All right, what about this guy? Because this is the one I actually care about sinking. You can see he's clipped into the uh, edge of the the pier there, and that uh, that can definitely be problem-causing. Get out of the way. <laughs> Sometimes you can brute force these by just a sheer number of torpedoes being launched. Wow, that one's set kind of deep. <laughs> uh, we don't need to risk that at this point. So we'll reset all of our position keeper stuff. Again, he's, he's stationary, so it really really doesn't matter I don't know why we're redoing this but apparently I am it's not a t3 I wish he was a t3 medium old large modern that's our that's our guy okay nope <laughs> uh, yeah that's pretty close so we, we, we definitely don't want to, uh... Firing three. <laughs> Watch, I miss again. That's the one thing of, that stinks about real fleet boat, is it removes the ship icons from the map. I mean, you already have a lot of distinct advantages from, uh... from just, just the way that this game behaves and treating... Oh my god, are we going to miss again? Ugh. Miss missing stationary targets. It's always a good sign. But a real fleet boat removes the ship icons that give you an idea of how long the ship is to more accurately, I guess you could call, uh, take these shots against stationary targets. Um, it does also give you a little bit better idea how long the ship is so you can like plan your angles for shots of moving targets as well, but uh, uh, it, it does a good job of removing it. And we're gonna miss. <clears throat> Magnetic influence might have gone off there. I think we're just gonna end up having to leave this dude. Yeah, that detonated on the shore. She sells seashells by the seashore. And we just turned up a whole bunch of them. Torpedo in the water. And at this point, it just kind of... Time accelerating. Try and get as, you know, good of visuals as we can, but... Uh, also recognizing that it's not particularly the most entertaining thing in the world to watch. Just an open blank piece of water waiting for one torpedo contrail to actually make it there. That's another thing that real fleet boat removed from the game, and that is the uh, torpedo icons. Now this one looks like he's going to hit the seawall, which I think is a good enough sign to say get the hell out of here. Yeah, he's going to hit the seawall. Fairly confident of that. Don't think that's going to do us any damage. Point. Uh. So the other option that we can accomplish, yes, yeah, he's not even sinking, and I think that's entirely because of the. Uh... Whoa, I think that's entirely because of the. He's trapped between the. After the ship is is caught on the sandbar. And the nose of the ship is caught on the, uh, the water. 
on the pier there. <laughs> Unfortunately, that means that our torpedo probably isn't going to kill him. Now, if this was the base game, he'd have a hit point bar system and it would just result in him exploding if he takes too many torpedoes. Now, that looks like it's going to be a lot closer. Dun, 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 I don't know why Monty Python just came to my head, but it did. <laughs> oh, brave Sir Robin. Uh, yeah, there you go. Right on the nose. Right on the kisser. Sweet. That's, you know, that's a, that's a fairly stout hit. Right on the nose. You'd think she would go down. But, like I said, I think it's because she's trapped on the, the pier, and then at the back end, I think both those things in combination mean she's just not moving. Um, that's really disappointing. Again, just trying to check to see if she's actually sinking or going down. It doesn't look like she's moving at all. Um, nice deck gun there. Definitely not a ship that I'd want to surface and, and attack anytime soon. Well, the only, our, our only other options are to try and get closer to the shore and launch them so that they hit on the right side. Uh, the downside to this, of course, is that uh, the shore is there. So we can't get too excited about getting too close because we'll either have to get raise ourselves up it's off the bottom of the water or the, uh, the bottom of the harbor or we will have a torpedo impact the shore before we actually like if we were to launch and we're in too shallow water we're either going to ground ourselves which is a very real problem uh, that can cause damage to the, the ship or the torpedoes aren't going to have enough time to get up in the water to their operating depth before they impact the, uh, yes, the sandbar. And to make things even more difficult, um, you know, you have a real narrow window at which you can launch these torpedoes and actually impact. I see he's not actually there. Yep. So once again, not able to fully detect. <laughs> there we go. No, not even close. So I guess we'll just try and eat some around there. Just got to be careful with the, the sandbar there, the, the shore. Not necessarily sandbar, but the shore. Set to contact, but that's a dead, that's a yes, unloaded torpedo tube. <laughs> Head third. Be nice to get a little bit more of an angle there. But again, we're, we're playing with the issue is, is depth under keel. So, uh... <laughs> 13 feet under the keel, 12 feet, 13. And, and this sends out a, an active ping every time you do that. So it's extremely dangerous <laughs> uh, yes, to do that with, with escorts around. So you definitely don't want to do that with escorts around if you can avoid it. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Ship spotted. Ship spotted. We are like right on the shore. <laughs> uh, and it's still look at how close do we need to get to this dude for to actually maintain the lock? That's the part that is just mind boggling to me. So now what we're seeing is we're actually seeing the compounding errors and the 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 torpedo data computer. Okay, so we went ahead and yes, launched sir. that torpedo. And I'm pretty sure... Yeah, he... The fact that he went out and uh, exploded where he did is really scary. <laughs> it's really scary for a multitude of reasons. The biggest of which is, uh, had that gotten any closer to us, that could have damaged us. Two... Um... It's definitely going to give away our position, but I'm sure some of those dudes are very thankful for no longer having to wear their... Uh, oh, yeah, see, we're like... We're right on the uh, the bottom of the ocean there. 
uh, the shore. Some of my dudes are no longer having to uh, wear scuba gear, though. So we are going to rotate our back end so it points south. We are going to... There we go. That's going to give us a little bit of extra breathing yes, room. With these torpedoes. It also means that they're not going... <sighs> the bottom of the ocean. All right. Probably going to end up dumping our entire torpedo complement on this crazy thing. Yes, sir. I don't want to go any higher. Like, you don't want to raise up any further because our superstructure is out of the water already. You know, we have watchmen that are <laughs> exposed right now. And uh, we don't want them to be. Okay, let's readjust this angle just a smidge. And... Yeah, we'll leave the contact influence on there. That way, if it uh, skips down the side of the ship, it will uh, has a higher potential to actually ooh, get it up there. Turn, nice. Whew. So with the con, with the if if it skips along the side of the ship, hopefully that will uh, you know the, set off our overly sensitive magnetic influence detonator. Uh, not holding my breath for obvious reasons. <laughs> Where is it? There it is. We can actually... And it detonated prematurely. Uh. So this is the other problem that uh, magnetic influence pistols on uh, torpedoes had, and that was that... Uh, <laughs> that was that the torpedoes, if there was a strong deposit of iron Torpedo somewhere, uh, it, it could the magnetic field from that could actually um, distort and the firing pin and cause it to go off prematurely. Yeah, we'll hopefully get there this time. Looks like a pretty good shot. Looks like we're going to hit the right side of it, but... Again, I don't. I just don't know that we can deplete the hit point pool like that. So we'll follow her in. Hopefully, we can get lucky. Get a good detonation. Okay, looks like we are going to hit on the right side there. How far down? A little bit off the nose. I mean, at this point, you would expect, like, the nose to fall off. It's had three torpedo hits on <laughs> two sides in the nose. Yeah, it's just not sinking. Um, yeah, we're just going to have to leave. There's no point yes, in hanging sir. around uh, around this port trying to get anywhere. It's just kind of pointless. You know, just do our thing and... Uh, Get the heck out of here, and if we were smart, we could have dumped our other our aft torpedoes there. We could have dumped them towards uh, towards the enemy, but it's just not worth it. So back to Brisbane we go. Brisbane, Brisbane. Where's my Australian folk at? Need some hep. Pronunciating the words. Surface, surface, surface. So with the fleet boats, we actually uh, a head standard is our most fuel efficient, our most fuel efficient speed. We get a fairly long distance out of it, and we're at three quarters. The only reason we're returning back to port is because of the freaking uh, torpedo shortage on the boat. Thankfully, Mark 14s are free. Mark 10s are actually more expensive than Mark 14s right now. Radar contact, uh, bearing 314. Is that a ship? Looks like it. Oh, task force. We should probably go underwater. Or be, you know, play things the risky way. Shingle contact, <clears throat> bearing 2, three, five, one, four, four. <laughs> Uh, two nine or zero. Pretty sure this is just two sub chasers, or it's a destroyer and a sub chaser. Thankfully, the Japanese do not have surface search radar at this point, so that helps out a, a lot. 
Well, yep, destroyer and a sub chaser. Had they had surface search radar, they would have most likely have spotted and, and turned in. So what kind of destroyer are we? You're set up like the Fubuki, but you've got twin torpedo tubes like a Minikaze or another one. I'd like to identify what the hell that is. Damn it. Nope. <laughs> Damn it. So we go to the destroyers. Nope. 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 Wrong guns. No, we know it's not Hatsuharu. We know it's not Fubuki. No, it's not a Sashio. And that's a light cruiser. So... I'm guessing it's a Minikaze with uh, upgraded turrets, but like... It just doesn't make any sense. It's not Mutsuki. It's definitely not Teretsuki. Or sub chasers. I don't know what it is. Definitely not that. Yeah. Weird. It's some weird hybrid uh, ship that <laughs> doesn't exist in real life, apparently. <laughs> uh, then we get quite quickly into uh, cruisers. Oh well, who cares? Uh, keep going that way. <laughs> We're going back to port. Because we are out of torpedoes. And I don't feel like trying to torpedo a destroyer. Not in this condition. Certainly not with steam torpedoes. Destroyers have really, really good acceleration. Uh, it's just not worth trying to... Uh, trying to torpedo one without an electric torpedo to hide the wake. Uh, radar contact this close to... Uh, Australia, most assuredly a friendly ship. Single contact. Bearing. Yes, yes. Four, three. Long range. Yes, yes. We are in shallow water, <laughs> sir. No way. It's almost like we're in a port or harbor or something. What I do find interesting is just how the how deep that that section those sections are. All right, rearm refuel. And let's uh, make sure that we get our torpedo starting to load, and then we'll do it again. Because that's a uh, thing of the game. But look at how many torpedoes we can carry. I mean, we can carry 24 of these suckers. 12 up front, 12 out back. Yes, sir. It's pretty awesome. I'm not going to lie. All stop. Yes, let's go see what kind of uh, ships that we have in, in the harbor today. As we send out, yet again, send out our seaplane that we don't have because we're, you know, an American fleet boat and fleet boats never carried seaplanes. Ever. <laughs> there we go. Whoo! Looks like we got a carrier over there. Cruiser. That looks like a Kent. And what do we got here? No, those are Kent's. That is a Yorktown. That's a Baltimore, or a Brooklyn, rather. Or it could be a St. Louis, and look at that, another Yorktown. And that is a Northampton, it looks like. A couple destroyers. Oh, battleship! What kind of battleship we got here? Now, this is a weird configuration. So the the gun configuration on this is uh so well it's got the clipper bow so it's got to be a California. That's the that's the big giveaway. So we know it's not a New Mexico class because we know none of the New Mexicos really got this loadout like this. Uh we know it's not the Colorado. We've still got cage mass, but we've got the clipper bow. So that clipper bow on the front tells us it has to be the Tennessee or California. But they're not in the game. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> we're, we're already past Single it. Contact. That's all the battleships we got. Three, Time to go five, home. Four, okay, so we go back here and we look. And you can see there's no... So Colorado class has the clipper bow, but in the, the short cage mast. 
but none of the 5 inch 38 dual purpose secondaries. The New Mexico doesn't have the 5 inch 38 dual purpose secondaries. It's like, what the hell is it? <laughs> uh, this could very well be a problem with the real fleet boat. Uh, <laughs> uh, Oni. Well, I guess 41 to 42, so we we actually uh we actually don't have the latest version of it. <laughs> yeah, it's just weird. I I'm not sure like I'm not sure where where the creators of this game actually cuz this is an in-game model. Real Fleet Boat didn't add any new in-game models. Um I'm really curious to know where they got the inspiration for the 5-inch 38s on this thing because uh uh, in this configuration, I don't think it, the California or the Tennessee actually looked this way. Um, I'd be really curious to know, though, for sure. You can see she it doesn't have the add-on torpedo bulges either. <laughs> it's just an anomaly. Because it, it wasn't until later that the 5-inch 38s got installed on them. Now, it's entirely possible that there is an error with the um, in-game models, much similar to the way, like, the Minikaze has the dual-purpose gun mounts uh, The for the Japanese. The It's very possible that a very similar thing could be happening to the New Mexico in this case, and that the New Mexico model, the 5-inch 51 think is what it was um model got replaced with dual purpose five inch 38 that's entirely yes, possible sir. albeit a bit odd <laughs> but it's not difficult to do that in these yes, games sir. in fact i have a picture somewhere of uh well i think it was on my photo bucket account a long time ago it was a picture of a u-boat with the graf Spey 11 inch gun turrets on the as a replacement for the deck gun like, that was the level of modding that you could do, and they actually worked as eleven as the eleven inch deck guns. Um, it was a bit trippy to go underwater with that setup. Um, surprisingly, very resistant to depth charges from my memory. <laughs> also required very few crew, given the size of the actual uh, uh, <laughs> the actual gun. Not that I'm complaining. <laughs> Uh, modding this game was a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. Modding the modding uh, Silent Hunter 5 was a lot of fun, too. But we're going to head up into the Bismarck Sea. That seems to be where a lot of... Uh, yes, he didn't sink. That seems to be where a lot of enemy shipping operates is in the Bismarck Sea area. Hopefully we'll get to run into some troop transports running towards uh, the Solomon Islands. Uh, but uh, we got a long ways to go before we get to uh, uh, naval battle at Guadalcanal. So once we get to there, though, should be interesting. I promise you. So we're going to set up our search pattern. Um, not a whole lot in the way of islands to hit in the Bismarck Sea. It seems like the vast majority of enemy shipping comes through the uh, northern parts. Ooh, yeah, we do have to be careful down there, though. So it seems like most of them come through that northern part. We're going to have to hang out up there a little bit more. But, man... The, like we already burned through half our fuel load. Whoop, whoop. Task force received. Okay, radio report. He's not that close. He's not close enough to set us off. So I don't know what that's all about. Yes, sir. We'll set our uh, we'll set our path to see if we can't intercept him. You never know what kind of things you'll get, what kind of trouble you'll get yourself into. I wish I would have paid a little bit better attention. Japanese army thoroughly beaten in New Guinea. American and Australian forces kicked Japanese off the island. Nice! So that means this island here that we're traveling next to is completely empty of Japanese, apparently. Be nice if we started getting those uh, assistant, the submarine assistants, the, not assistant, what's the word I'm looking for? Submarine tenders, that's the word I'm looking for. So that was the pack news that we received. Kind of slowly chugging along here. I don't know what, what exactly I was doing. Or if the game just kind of... Nope, it didn't. Just had a really low time compression for some odd reason. I must have been talking about something there and not paying much attention. 
I don't know. We'll just keep going on. So the other thing too is uh, I, these task force don't run this close to the uh, to the islands. They generally take again a, a, a northern route around the island there on the right hand side of the screen, right center part of the screen, right at the two degrees south line. And yeah, they're past us by now. Well, that's annoying. Nope, oh, ship straight north of us. That could be fun and interesting. Should pay probably better attention. But uh, yeah, see, they're they're all the way back towards the Bismarck Sea, and we're we're getting uh, to a point where it's kind of dangerous for us to get too far away from the mainland. There, definitely don't want to go over any islands. So we'll we'll head off to uh, Rabal and see what kind of objectives we can actually come up with. Oh, looks like we are going to go after that guy. Eep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that one's going to get away from us. Third right, turn to course. <laughs> we just won't talk about that one. That was really, really sketchy. We're not we're definitely not going to catch up to that task force. That would be really unusual. So at this point, we're just going to head back, refuel. I mean, not not seeing us. Oop, ship spotted. Ooh, 5 o'clock in the morning, we got ourselves a ship spotted. Oh, we should probably actually go up to the front of the ship. Okay. Ship spotted at 033. Holy buckets. What is that? <laughs> That's a troop transport. Uh, what are the odds? Alright, so get our, our, our speed once again, counting three minutes. Move, in the, move the marker there. One minute, two minutes, two and a half minutes. Okay, now we're going to set a kind of a 90 degree course. We're, looks like we're lining up for stern torpedo shot. And three minutes. Okay. So now that we've got those two marks, once again, measuring the distance between them. It's like uh, 900 yards, so he's going about nine knots. And we are looking at about 950 yards. Oh, no, we're headed towards him. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to turn in and use the, the bow torpedoes. So once again, one of the big problems with the Dick O'Kane method with the Mark 14s this early on in the war has entirely to do with the um, entirely to do with the detonators. Just it's just dangerous, right? So here we go. We're gonna do our, our quick maths here. So we know he's going at nine knots, so that's 900 yards. Um, and we have torpedoes that are. I don't know why I'm putting 900 there. That's 45 degrees, <laughs> dummy. We don't have nine knot torpedoes. <laughs> that math doesn't add up one bit. <laughs> yes, sir. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir, it doesn't add up one, one iota. So we actually have torpedoes that uh, go significantly faster than nine knots, which means we don't have to launch them at a 45 degree effing angle. Uh, I don't think he's a New Mexico class battleship. In fact, we're fairly confident he's not. We are confident that he is, however. No. Uh, yeah, he's going to be off to your left there, buddy. Follow the smoke. He's a two-stacker. There you go. So 9,000 tons carrying uh, passengers, a.k.a. troops. So we have, this is me double-checking the speed, so 46 knots, which means we need to go 4,600 yards on the tack map to get a more accurate representation of what our actual number needs to be. So 4,600 yards... 
I'm pretty sure the angle is about 10 degrees, 11 degrees, rather. You, you see... <laughs> Suka. <laughs> yeah, 11 degrees. So, gotta set this uh, up for an 11 degree hit. Okay. Trying to set this distance as far as it'll go and... Nope. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. We gotta get more range. That, 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 that's, that's better, but, uh... <laughs> no, you had it right the first time, buddy. <laughs> uh... In reality, with the Mark 14 and this early in the war, you should be setting up shots using the position keeper, using traditional torpedo attack techniques. Uh, until you get the more reliable detonators, it's just, um, there we go. It's just much more reliable to get uh, torpedo hits with, um, yeah, we're going to save it. It's just much more reliable to get torpedo detonations with the Mark 14 when you have a little bit more than that uh, 11 degree angle. Realistically, should be uh, should be doing quite a lot more. So we're going to double check the speed here. Something this valuable, you definitely don't want to let it get away from you. That's two minutes. <laughs> Got a bit ahead of myself. And... There's our three minutes. Ah! There we go. Once again, measuring between the two points, they look fairly consistent. Yep. So we know he's got uh, a nine knot speed there. Again, yes, when, when you've got this much time, we're going to go ahead and back up some because of the, the rough seas. Uh, we definitely don't want him seeing our, our mast. Yes, sir. Ugh. Yeah, you, you see, you see how how much the waves are moving up and down, and how it's uh... <laughs> crews wearing scuba gear. <laughs> um, how much it's unmasking our crew members. We definitely go, we definitely want to be careful because we can set them, we can set them off. High speed impact. And what's our depth on this thing? So he's got a draft of 28 feet. I'm going to split the kind of split the difference here on these torpedoes. Uh, about half. This is going to also help with our issues surrounding uh, impact angles. Uh, again, the lower you can impact a, a ship, the better off you're actually going to end up being. You want to... Uh, and the reason for that is because of the whole shape of the ship. You know, it has that uh, kind of rounded bottom profile... And that will definitely help get more reliable detonations. Now, of course, um, we kind of goobered this one up. <laughs> uh, the reason why I say that is it really shouldn't be... So we are looking... We will be launching... Oh, no, that is right. That is set up right for a, a true Dick O'Kane methodology. Again, we really don't... Because, look, you can see where the torpedo is actually going to impact there on the zero line. I just not... <laughs> that's wrong. So now the reality sinks in that that's uh, a bit wrong. But I think we end up getting lucky. I think we end up developing... A, the skipjack ends up developing a reputation that's going to stick with it for a while. <laughs> No, I'm not going to tell you what that is right now. Yeah. I think we'll be all right. We just need to be patient. 800 yards. Oof. These are, this is a fairly close torpedo shot. I mean, this is fairly ideal, too. And we are also nowhere near the angle that we need to be at. <laughs> I <laughs> yipe 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 yipe. <laughs> oh gosh. 
gonna be pretty close. Pretty dang close. All right, so same same methodology should apply here, even though we're set up for a perfectly 90 degree angle attack. Um, so he's there. <laughs> all of the little errors not being perfectly 90 degrees, um, all of that ends up compounding things a little bit. Trying to raise yes, us up sir. in the water so that we can get a, a little bit above these waves because it's really, really hard to keep continuous spotting on this ship. Yep, we know for a fact that's what she is. We're all set to go. Just need to get the spots on. Ooh, it looks like he's that a deck gun on the front. It's hard to hard to really see. Ah, he's slow moving for a passenger liner. Usually these dudes are just hauling the mail. All right, one away. Two away. And three away. I think we're close enough that the, the errors don't add up too too badly in this case, but you can definitely see the errors. Okay, so... Dud. Oh, we got one impact dead center. Oh, no, we get, okay, so we got, we got two impacts dead center. This isn't the engagement that I was thinking it was. Sometimes the engagements, um, they do some other things. Oh, he's dead in the water. So he may, he may yet sink. Um, <laughs> one thing's for certain, he's hurting. He's definitely on fire. He's definitely got some holes in his hole. You could say he put on his best. Oh, those were the two deeper ones too. So this is what that's what happens when you hit deeper on the ship. So the first one that we launched was the one that was set right at uh, at ten feet, and at ten feet the whole profile of the ship is still roughly vertical, and so the torpedoes didn't impact correctly. These other two were set at fifteen feet, just five feet deeper, made the difference in getting these torpedoes to detonate. Once again, shows the disadvantage of the Dick O'Kane methodology in the um, Mark 14 torpedoes in the early war. But putting making her dead in the water is actually a really good thing. I mean, it, this basically gives us as much time as we need to, uh, you know, hunt, basically kill him. Yes, so sir. we'll sit here and we'll watch him for a little bit. And... Uh, Watch him sink. Also, while I'm doing that, I'm researching when the Mark 14 got its uh, corrected uh, up to date. That's nice, McPhee. Okay. <laughs> uh. Controversy. I want. Resolution. There we go. Okay, by the end of the war. Yeah, what, 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 what? <laughs> uh, Wikipedia. Mark 14 had four major flaws. It tended to run about 10 feet deeper than set. The magnetic exploder often caused premature firing. The contact exploder often failed to fire the warhead. And it had a tendency to run circular, failing to straighten its run once set on a prescribed gyro angle setting, and instead to run in a large circle, thus returning and striking the firing ship. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. We don't need depth testing, although that is kind of an interesting... Like, the Mark 14 is its own, own interesting thing. By August of 42, the faulty running depth solution situation was resolved. The submarines were getting more hits. However, the curing the deep running problem caused more prematures and duds, even as more hits were, <laughs> were being achieved. The number of sinkings did not uh, uh, improve. Okay. On April 9th, 1943, USS Tunney attacked an aircraft carrier formation. Ultra intercepts disclosed that all three torpedoes fired at the second carrier 
For premature explosions, the commanding officer stated, the shallow depth setting thus caused the torpedo to reach the activating flux density of the explorer some 50 meters from the target. USS Pam Pompano attacked Japanese aircraft carrier Shikaku by firing six torpedoes. There were at least three premature explosions. The aircraft carrier was not damaged. <laughs> God, this thing is just freaking insane. Six torpedoes at Hiyu. Hiyo. Two torpedoes missed. One exploded prematurely. One was a dud and two hit. Carrier was damaged. Well, that was at least uh, <laughs> an exciting time. On 9th of April, 1943, uh, John A. Scott, commander of the USS Tunney, found himself in an ideal position to attack an aircraft carrier formation consisting of Hiyo, Junyo, and Tayo. That's two uh, light escort carriers and the armored carrier. Or no, that's uh, three light aircraft carriers. Tayo is a converted um, transport ship, if I remember correctly. Fired all ten tubes. Hearing all four stern shots and three of the bow, the bow's six shots explode. No enemy carrier was seen to diminish its speed, although Tayo was light, lightly damaged in the attack. Much later, intelligence reported each of the seven explosions had been premature. The torpedoes had run true. The magnetic feature had fired them too early. <laughs> uh, they don't get deactivated till May of 43. <laughs> no. Mush Martin. Commander of... Well, who was he, what ship was he on at the time? That's what I want to know. Uh, June of 43, ask Commander-in-Chief of Pacific Fleet Chester Nimitz for permission to deactivate the magnetic explorer the next day, 24 June. Sin C. Pack ordered all of his submarines to deactivate the magnetic explorer. We have to wait until the 24th of June, 1943. Oh yeah, she's going down. Get some screenshots of this. That way you can see this picture again in the not too distant future. I, I do have to admit, like, the study of all of the... So the problem with the... <laughs> the Germans in the, in the U.S. had two very different um, magnetic exploders, magnetic pistols, and... Um, they had the same problems with regards to premature detonations and not going off around ships. And it's not a sensitivity issue at all. The, the problem is almost entirely related to magnetic, rough magnetic fields around the Earth and not calibrating for it. Like I said, the Germans kind of uh, patchwork that by doing a little bit better tuning of the magnetic fields for the areas that they were in. But they really didn't have a very good idea of what magnetic fields were doing at that point in time. So, like, any tuning was very, very, very rough. Um, the United States just flat disabled them in June of 1943. Got a long ways to go to disable that in this game. Huh. But the problem with the contact detonators, that's a more interesting one. So the United States decided in the, in the detonators on the Mark 14s, that the firing pin would be mounted vertically. And in doing so, it made it really insensitive to those 90 degree hits because it was what it was happening was the torpedo was traveling fast enough it would crush the, uh, the actual detonating mechanism. Uh, so you had to hit it at more of an angled. <laughs> Quick fix was to encourage glancing shots, which cut the number of duds in half until permanent solution could become... <laughs> could be found. That's funny. Um, let's see. Yep. <laughs> Buor just assumed the contact exploder would work at the higher speeds of the Mark 14 torpedo. <laughs> no live fire tests of this of the contact exploder were were performed. That sounds like a very American thing to do. <laughs> Holy crap! Another another one. Uh, this has got to be uh, sampans. Well, it's kind of dark for sampans. Sampan. Of course it is. Do, 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 do. So, submarine stationed at Pearl Harbor made working exploders by using lighter weight aluminum parts, reducing the mass and binding friction of the uh, exploder. In September of 1943, the fourth 
The first torpedoes with the new contact pistols were sent to war. After 21 months of war, the three major defects in the Mark 14 had at last been isolated. Each defect had been discovered and fixed in the field, always over the stubborn opposition of the Bureau of Ordnance. Those are sand pans. Of course they are. Circular run attack sank the submarine Tulabi. Likewise, Sargo was almost sunk by circular run, but the circular run happened because the gyro had not been installed. Well, that I imagine would cause some problems. <laughs> um, the subsequent Mark 18 torpedo was no better at sink was no better and sank the USS Tang. The service launch Mark 15 torpedo had collars to prevent circular runs, but the Mark 14 was never given this feature. Of course not. Apparently, circular runs were never addressed during the war. Huh. Well, there you have it. Uh, ooh. After the war, the best features of the improved Mark 14 were merged with the best features of the captured German torpedoes to create the hydrogen peroxide field Mark 16 with the pattern running option. Mark 16 became the standard United States post-war anti-shipping torpedo, despite the large remaining inventory of Mark 14s. Talk about leaving a bad taste in the mouth of everybody who possibly freaking ran them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, talk about cutting it close. Gonna have like a couple hundred miles of extra. Ooh, we must be in really rough seas. That's probably not helping the situation any. But I think we're definitely nearing the end of this, uh... Not the end of this patrol, but definitely the end of this Let's Play video. We are over the hour mark. Oh, yeah, we're good. We got 220 miles after the fact. Get out of the way! <laughs> yes, yes, we're in shallow waters. We can move that guy back up there. We just moved him for the sake of uh, picture taken. We've got an enemy in our in our base and rearm refuel so at this point we are going to go ahead and we are going to rearm refuel and uh ooh, we're all loaded up there you have it and uh you know um i think we're just going to go ahead and we're going to call it there uh, eventually we're going to you know naval battle guadalcanal happens around savo island right there hopefully you know we're getting closer and closer to that and uh Unfortunately, it's a couple more patrols before we actually get there. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> it's four more episodes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. I'm actually Whiskey11. Like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. There's also a link down in the description to the Discord server. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Anyway, Whiskey11 signing us out of the gaming lounge. Like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. And thanks for watching.